what would you do to get your kids to read? I've tried pleading. I've tried candy. Food. TV. Letting him stay up late. It was heavy negotiations. We even had to have a contract. Now you don't have to bargain or plead to get your kids to read. Just give them Sports Illustrated for kids. Here's why. It's exciting, so they're excited to read it. Sports Illustrated for Kids is a fun magazine. He's always reading and always asking us questions. We have found Mark blooming with reading. Kids love everything from the puzzles and posters to the sports stars, mazes, and games. I like the trivia math questions because it helps me on my math skills. I like hot shots because it tells about kid athletes. They're excited to turn the page because of the fact that they can read about their hero as well as children their age. Fun facts know and tell is what Mark will use to stump dad. I like Buzz Beamer a lot because he's, he's a goof. Sports Illustrated for Kids is more than just fun, it's an education. This opens up avenues to all sorts of educational values. Sportsmanship, self-esteem, teamwork. They're learning, they don't even realize it. As a coach, it really helps the kids learn how to play the game. Sports Illustrated for Kids should be in every classroom. Call now and get a year's worth of Sports Illustrated for Kids for four monthly installments of $5.99. Save over 20% off the cover price. Your kids will love getting it in the mail with their name on it. He's proud to have his name on. He's proud. He feels like he's a part of something much bigger. Give it to your children or grandchildren today. Our granddaughter is 10 years old, and she insisted that we give her a subscription to Sports Illustrated for Kids because all the kids at school were talking about it. Giving Sports Illustrated for Kids is a gift of learning, a gift for a lifetime. So call now, use your credit card, and discover what millions of parents already know, that Sports Illustrated for Kids is the magazine that your kids will love. Now that Mark is reading, I can't get him to stop reading. My son is reading now because of Sports Illustrated for Kids. We think reading is number one in importance, and this is an easy way to start that process. Sports Illustrated for Kids is an awesome magazine. Scott Case has played a whale of a game today, putting the hits on. Out of the shotgun and four wide receivers again against the Cowboy Nickel with Bates in the middle. Here's a pass in the flat, picked oh. up by the Cowboys. Larry Brown may score at the 30. The Dallas Cowboys have won three Super Bowls in four years. Will 1996 bring yet another Vince Lombardi trophy? 29 other NFL teams are out to stop them. The National Football League. No other professional sport has such compelling appeal. Witness the artistry. The intensity. The spectacle. Marcus Sheldon dives over and by touchdown for Kansas City. His 100th career rushing touchdown. Move over James Lofton. You've just been passed by Jerry Rice in the record book. And Dan Marino has the granddaddy of them all now. Most touchdown passes ever. It's America's autumn ritual, stirring up passions that only a hometown fan can understand. I'm Peter King of Sports Illustrated, your host for the 1996 Oakland Raiders Video Yearbook, featuring a retrospective of last year's season entitled Return to Oakland, the story of the 1995 Raiders. A special Oakland classic segment, the 20th anniversary of the 1976 Super Bowl champions. And a profile of today's Raiders, the proven stars and those on the rise. How do they stack up against the defending Super Bowl champs? Let's take a look at the 1996 Oakland Raiders. The climb to the summit in the NFL is an arduous journey, but Mike White's Raiders are being guided this season by two men who have traveled the road to the Super Bowl, Russell Maryland and Larry Brown, formerly of the world champion Cowboys. The thing that I like about their acquisition of Russell Maryland and Larry Brown is that these are guys who have been tremendously unselfish players on the best team in football in the 90s. I think that there's a lot, you know, away from the line of scrimmage, away from the ball, off the field, that they add. Brown and Maryland are planning to make major contributions on and off the field. And the Raiders can only hope they enjoy their first season in Oakland as much as Pat Swilling did in 95. I think a lot of people in the NFL gave Pat Swilling up for dead 
when the Lions basically gave up on him. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. When he went to the Raiders, they told him what became music to his ears. Just go after the quarterback. Rush the quarterback. That's your job. And he responded by being the second leading sacker in the NFL. I think that, that this guy reaffirmed his place in the NFL last year by being given the opportunity that he hadn't had in several years. With swilling rushing from the outside and Pro Bowl defensive tackle Chester McLaughlin dominating the inside, the Raiders are sure to spend their share of time in opponents' backfields. Downfield, Terry McDaniel is ready for another Pro Bowl season. McDaniel is among the NFL's best cover men, and he has a knack for finding the end zone. The end zone is a place Raider runners Napoleon Kaufman and Harvey Williams find often. You know, the Raiders have kind of a weird running back duo because if you're talking about Napoleon Kaufman and Harvey Williams, what you're talking about are two guys who, you know, are not the big banger type Mark Van Egan type guys. I mean, the Raiders have always had, you know, the real kind of big backs. They don't really have that now, but it's been effective because I think of these guys' ability to run outside and ability to keep things fresh. I think both guys have shown a real skill in getting outside and, and now, when defenses are getting tired in the fourth quarter, they're still able to run outside because they've got basically a doubleheader. The Raiders hope their let's play two philosophy at tailback generates some home runs. But when the silver and black play long ball, they're usually referring to their passing game. One of the key things with the Raiders always has been is the development of a really good deep passing game. And you've seen it now with Tim Brown and Rocket Ismail and James Jett. I mean, the Raiders continue to develop guys, deep receiving cores that make it very, very hard for you to match up with a particular guy. If you want to match up, say, with Tim Brown, then you're going to be leaving other guys alone. Trying to match up with Tim Brown is a thankless and nearly impossible task for Raider opponents. I think Tim Brown has been a very effective Chris Collinsworth type guy over the middle where, you know, he's got a lot of fearlessness in him and he's got a lot of really good uh, after the catch ability uh, in him. And so I think this is more of a complete receiving core than the, than the perception would have it. And I think the perception is that they're only deep threats. Ostetler throwing the fade into the corner of the end zone for Tim Brown. Touchdown Raiders! Oakland's receiving core is aided by first round draft pick tight end Ricky Dudley from Ohio State. But perhaps the key to the Raiders 96 season is the man who delivers the ball to all these talented pass catchers. Quarterback Jeff Hostetler. In terms of pure most valuable player recognition, I'm not sure that you can't argue that Jeff Hostetler was the most valuable player in the league in 1995. And in the offseason, when they re-signed Jeff, Al Davis looked him in the eye and basically said, hey, look, I want you to be my stabler, I want you to be my plunket, I want you to finish your career as a Raider. That meant a lot to Jeff, and I think we're going to see him end his career in silver and black. He stays on the field, he plays a 16-game season. Raiders are going to win 11, maybe 12. As you can see, the Raiders possess some impressive football talent. Last year, they returned to Oakland and at times brought back memories of great Raider teams of the past. They relied on players like Tim Brown, Harvey Williams, Chester McLaughlin, and Terry McDaniel, and just missed out on a playoff berth. In 1995, the Raiders, professional sports winningest team, returned to Oakland, their home for three glorious decades. We've been waiting 13 long years for them to come back, and they're back! We're back! Fans of all ages treasured this moment, for this was not an expansion team seeking a home. These were the mighty Raiders, whose tradition of greatness had continued in Los Angeles. 
During the memorable years in Southern California, the silver and black maintained its lofty status. 25 Los Angeles Raiders had been Pro Bowl choices. The 80s and 90s saw eight Raiders enshrined in the Hall of Fame. Before crowds that at times topped 90,000, the Los Angeles Raiders were playoff bound seven times. Won four division championships, the AFC Championship, and another world championship of professional football. The Raiders continued to strike fear throughout pro football with their famed vertical passing game, power running, and relentless attacking defense. traditions of the greatest players, greatest coaches, greatest plays, and greatest games return to Oakland. But the true greatness of the Raider organization remains in its future. Man, it is gorgeous here. It's going to be a great day. Great day. Let's go get them now. Let's go get them. Let's go get them. The Raiders opened the 95 season in the Oakland Coliseum against the defending AFC champion San Diego Chargers. Number 33, Eddie Anderson, got the season's first interception. Third and 13, Humphreys back to throw. Here comes the pressure. Goes deep down the far side, looking for Edge Everson, and it's picked up by Eddie Anderson. Quarterback Jeff Hosteller proved doubly dangerous to San Diego, picking up valuable yardage by Lamb. and through the air. Hostetler targeted running backs Harvey Williams, 22, and number 26 top draft choice, Napoleon Kaufman for key games. Then he teamed with wide receiver Tim Brown for the historic first touchdown back in Oakland. Firing in the end zone for Brown, touchdown Raiders! And it is appropriate that the first score for the return of the Oakland Raiders goes to a heart and soul player like Tim Brown. The roar of the crowd inspired defenders bent on destruction. Pat Swilling, number 56, got his first Raider sack. And corner Terry McDaniel, 36, led swarming tacklers stopping the pass. Then the run. Special teams made special plays. 57 linebacker Rob Holmberg recovered a fumble. After a booming Jeff Gossett punt, number 39 Bruce Pickens, 55 James Fulston, and 37 James Trapp down the ball on the one. And in the third quarter, rookie Cole Ford's long field goal opened a Raider lead. Out of the hold of Gossett, it's down, it's up, it's on its way, it's got the direction, does it? It's got the distance, and it's good. With 76, Steve Wisniewski and the big line dominating up front, the Raiders sprung the devastating one-two punch of Harvey Williams and Napoleon Kaufman. Just win, baby. A season that began so brilliantly would not reach the very high standards this proud organization demands of itself. Key injuries from Don Mosbar's preseason on one of the league's toughest schedules, and misfortune all season haunted the Raiders. Crucial big plays were disallowed. Controversial calls changed momentum or decided games. 
as these Raiders miss their 19th playoff season by just one game. It was a frustrating season for astute first-year head coach Mike White, the able coaching staff, and the entire Raider organization. But lessons were learned, players developed, and much accomplished. Harvey Williams again demonstrated thousand-yard capability. Opponents learned that the Raiders, with 19 new players, were still a dominating force on offense and defense. Opponents learned that great athletes still patrolled the Oakland secondary, as they had in decades past. skilled youngsters like quarterback Billy Joe Hobart and receivers James Jett and Daryl Hobbs were combat ready. Opponents saw new veterans like Kerry Cash produce and Tim Brown carry on the Raider tradition of wide receivers who set the standard of excellence. Fans fill the Oakland Alameda County Coliseum from the opening game on. The season's first road game put the Raiders in Washington, D.C. Intense special team efforts by Rocket Ishmael, Derek Fenner, Eric Ball, Mike Morton, Dan Land, Calvin Jones, and others enabled 26 Napoleon Kaufman to display balance and burst. With Dirk, Wisniewski, Gogan, Skrepanik, and Jenkins opening massive lanes, Harvey Williams powered through. Defense dominated as 91 Chester McLaughlin and 74 Nolan Harrison overpowered. Number 54, Greg Beaker, captured a quarterback. And when Washington did get a completion, defenders like number 29, Albert Lewis, and 37 Olympic sprinter James Trapp combined for a takeaway. Number 99, Andre Bruce, 20 Derek Hoskins, and an ominous, intimidating defense allowed no touchdowns. Meanwhile, Raider precision passing earned two second-half scores. Now Stetler, play fake, looking for the end zone, fires, he's got a man, touchdown Andrew Glover! Touchdown Raiders! Playing in front of family and friends, Haas was boss this day. Play fake, back to throw is Haas, Stetler, looking up the middle, fires into the end zone, wide open, he's got a man, touchdown Raiders! Derek Fenner, what a pass! Derek Hoskins' interception sealed another day of glory for the Oakland Raiders. Next for the Raiders, on the road against the Chiefs. Injury problems mounted as a broken arm sideline starting offensive tackle Gerald Perry, but special teams created opportunities. Tim Brown broke for 39 yards. And number 55, James Holston, 46, Carl Kidd, and 39, Bruce Pickens, pinned Kansas City deep. 93, Jerry Ball denied one Kansas City scoring attempt. A crushing hit by Eddie Anderson forced a fumble that Albert Lewis returned. Lewis continued to vex his former team as he registered a sack. 
On offense, Napoleon Kaufman and former Chief Harvey Williams help the Raiders battle into overtime. But as the Raiders drove toward victory, an official cut off Tim Brown's pattern, creating a game-ending interception. Now the Raiders returned home to take on the playoff-bound Philadelphia Eagles with both teams eager for action. Just a place to be right here. Unusual fans and an unusual first 10 minutes found the Raiders 17 points down. But no team in pro football history had demonstrated the comeback courage that was a Raider trademark. Cunningham spreads the defense with three wide receivers and drops back to throw. Sets it up in the flat for Waters, who's hit. It's a fumble. Young Austin Robbins, number 95, got Oakland on the scoreboard. And then aroused defenders zeroed in on enemy quarterbacks. Andre Bruce grounded one eagle, while number 94, Anthony Smith, forced a fumble that McLaughlin recovered. Terry McDaniel and Rob Fredrickson converted a tip pass into a turnover. Then pressure by Andre Bruce created opportunity for McDaniel. With defenders in silver and black now mastering the Eagles, Jeff Hostetler went quickly to number 80, Daryl Hobbs. Harvey Williams went long with a short pass. Then Hostetler, with time to search, pitched a strike to running back Derek Benner. Andre Bruce's relentless pressure set up another score. Pressure, he's hit, it's loose. And are they going to call it incompletion? No, picked up by Fredrickson, I don't hear a whistle. Touchdown Raiders! I never thought the play was stopped, and neither did the referee. The determined Raiders thundered to 48 unanswered points, second most in team history. Back in the pocket, setting up, going over the middle, wide open odds. Cuts it down to the 30, getting a block to the 25, 20, may go the distance. Now 3-1, and one, the Raiders headed east again for a Sunday night clash against the New York Jets. Kevin Gogan, Steve Wisniewski, and 77 Rich Stevens analyzed their mission on the sideline. With Dan Turk, Robert Jenkins, and Andrew Glover opening holes, Napoleon Kaufman showed outside speed. While receiver Rocket Ishmael showed toughness going across the middle. A great play fake by Williams helped Hostetler find Glover open in the end zone. Then Williams used blocks by Fenner, Jenkins, and Gogan to work through heavy traffic. A national television audience saw Williams find pay dirt. The lethal passing partnership of Hostetler and Brown combined on a perfect fade route. Then later teamed again for another Raiders score. Side with Fenner joining the wide receivers. Hostetler fires downfield to Brown. Is complete the 50. Breaks attack on the 40. There he goes down the sideline to the 30. The 20. Will he make it to the 10? 5. Touchdown Raiders. Hostetler threw four touchdown passes against the Jets. This one to Daryl Hobbs. Raider defenders dominated the evening's activities. Aaron Wallace, number 51 and Pat Swilling recorded sacks. James Folston prevented one completion, while Mike Jones converted another into an exciting Raider touchdown. Back to throw size and Aaron Wallace hits it as he releases it, fires for Cravat. He lost it after he caught it, picked up by Mike Jones on the right side of the 50. Down to the 40, gets a block to the 35, 30, still on his feet. Coming down the middle of the 20, still gets a block to the 10, to the 5. He's in! Touchdown, Mike Jones. That former Missouri Tiger running back takes it in. Make a stand!
Dave Mustaine, stand up for what you believe. Raider pride. One, two, three. Raider. Raider pride was evident against the visiting Seahawks, as was Raiders speed with Rocket Ishmael. Rockets return behind key blocks by 63 Barrett Robbins and Andrew Glover, excited Coach White, and helped ignite the Raiders. Austin, straight and deep, drop, sets up, he's got time, looking over the middle, guns it over the middle, complete the tip, Rob brings it to the 35, 40. Here he comes down the sideline to the 50, to the 40, makes a miss to the 30. He should sure take it the distance, he needs a block to the 10, to the 5, he's in! Touchdown Raiders! Silver and black clad warriors like number 42, Eric Ball, slashed and smashed. As did Andre Bruce, Aaron Wallace, Robbins, Anderson, and others. Mike Jones' interception prevented one touchdown. While Harvey Williams with blockers up front and downfield hit for the distance. Second and long, a sweep to Harvey Williams, cuts it back inside of the 20. Goes up the middle of the 15, to the 10, to the 5, will he get there? Yes, touchdown Raiders! Williams ran for one score and threw for another. Austin from pitching, Williams going over to the right side, looking to throw back the other way, wide open, Glover, touchdown Raiders! Dropping back to throw, looks up the right side, fires, he's got a man, touchdown, Perry Cash! Raider mind and muscle earned a 34-14 victory. With Hostetler injured, Vince Evans would start against the Colts, with Billy Joe Hobart in ready reserve. Veterans like 29 Albert Lewis, Russell Freeman, Jeff Jager, and rookies like 79 Jeff Geyser, Matt Dyson, Joe Aska, and Marcus Hinton were primed and ready. Kaufman, a very short one, will take him to the run, gets behind the wedge at the 18, coming over to the near side, up the middle, he goes 25, 30, 35, 40, he's gone, he's hit three, 40, 30, to the 20, the Raiders take the lead. Defense! 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 Pro Bowl choice, Chester McLaughlin, 91, and Andre Bruce, 99, lassoed Colt runners, while McLaughlin, Anthony Smith, and Jerry Ball corral their quarterback. As Raiderettes and fans cheered, Evans triggered an aerial explosion against the playoff-bound Colts. He teamed twice with Ishmael for touchdowns. Evans on a play fake, sets up, he's got some time, and he's going to go for the home run, and he's got a wide open rock in the end zone. Touchdown Raiders! Goes Evans in the offense, back to throw his Vince, looking deep and firing for the Rocket, who's got to step on his man and makes a catch at the 30. With Rocket, Jack, Brown, and Hobbs in stride, the Raiders won 30-17 and headed for Cincinnati. With Derek Venner leading, Napoleon Kaufman got the ground game online. And Harvey Williams, with 134 yards rushing, got Oakland on the scoreboard. Jeff Hostetler eluded the rush and found Kerry Cash open. And then found top target Tim Brown for another Raider touchdown. Count by Hostetler. Doesn't get him to jump, but he's going to throw on second and short. Fires up at the near side. Tim Brown makes it right at the 20. Down to the 15. Cuts it inside of the 10. He'll take it in. Touchdown, Raiders. Sack leader Pat Swilling, along with Ball and Smith, were relentless pass rushers on the artificial turf. Pro Bowl choice Terry McDaniel intercepted deep. Then got a crushing block from 53, Rob Fredrickson. Dan Turk snap, 
Gossett's hole, and Jeff Jager's long field goal ensured a 20-17 triumph. The Raiders' fourth cross-country trip in nine games found them at the Meadowlands again. Former Giant Jeff Hostetler teamed with Daryl Hobbs Shorts and then went deep through six. Lockton and Swilling stopped one runner, and number 31 Joe King straightened another. Anthony Smith and Austin Robbins got a sack. Then Smith and Swilling team for a takeaway. With skill and daring, Terry McDaniel upended one giant. And then came down with another interception. Blocking by tight ends Glover and Cash and the entire line helped Kaufman and Williams seal this total team victory. As the 95 season unfolded, major construction was underway at the Oakland Coliseum. When the Raiders take the field in 1996, the Coliseum will have been rebuilt. A state-of-the-art facility, friendly for fans, but still with no place for opponents to hide. when Al Davis first pledged to build the greatest organization in pro sports, the Raiders have totally dominated in terms of consistent victory. Decades of destiny have proven that the flame that burns brightest in this organization is the will to win, and that unrivaled commitment to excellence has now returned to Oakland. Now that you've seen the Raiders highlight, let's take a trip back into Oakland history. We'll celebrate the 20th anniversary of one of pro football's most dominant teams the world champion 1976 Raiders. Then we'll get an inside look at the colorful cast of characters that helped create the Raider mystique. One reason why the Oakland Raiders went all the way in 1976 was because they were able to overcome the Pittsburgh Steelers, the team that had haunted Oakland throughout the decade of the 1970s. Steelers were growing, and you could see them getting these number one draft picks, and they were all good guys. And when they emerged, they came on so fast that we thought it was our turn. It's no more Chiefs, no more Dolphins, it's the Raiders' turn. And who are these jerks over here in Pittsburgh going to take our thunder? So we got a little upset at these guys. The Raiders had reason to be upset. In the 1972 playoffs, they were victimized by the immaculate reception. Two years later, the Raiders pulled out their own miracle playoff victory. But while Oakland ended Miami's two-year reign as world champions, it was the Steelers who became the successors to the Dolphin dynasty. They beat us in our park in 74 in the championship game. They go on and thump Minnesota in the Super Bowl. 75, we go to Pittsburgh for the championship game, and it is freezing. 
when the teams came out on the field, the, the right sideline was frozen with ice. And they suspected that maybe somehow the grounds crew had concocted that. Our game was the throwing, the deep ball. So with that ice, we had to move those receivers in, and that narrowed the field for us. I'll never forget Pete Rosell said to me, well, it's the same for both sides. I said, damn it, Pete, you don't even understand what you're talking about. It's not the same for both sides. After the 1975 championship, the Raiders did not have to wait long for a rematch. Opening day, it was 100 degrees, the Santa Ana winds were blowing, and here comes the Steelers all cocky. It was like we were going to leave it out there. If we don't win that day, forget the season. We put it on the line, we talked about it, Madden pulled out all the stoppers, and we just went after them. With their opening day victory setting the tone, the Raiders marched through the season like men on a mission. They won 13 of 14 games with their finest overall performance coming long after they had clinched the AFC West title. Cincinnati, if they beat us, they were in the playoffs and would knock off, knock out Pittsburgh. If we won, then that would knock out Cincinnati and put in Pittsburgh. I can remember plainly uh, the news the media coming out with, yeah, we're going to lose because we don't want to meet the Steelers. Well, we weren't that type of a team. We wanted the best team on the field to, to play against in order to get to the championship and the Super Bowl. Of all the games I ever coached in my life, I was the most proud of that game and that team. I mean, we not only beat Cincinnati, but we beat them big. The Raiders got what they wanted. This time, there was no icy field, no miracle play, only a discouraged Steeler team unaccustomed to losing a championship. After the end of the season, when Chuck Noll accuses the Oakland Raiders of uh, brutality in the league or something that made us all go to court over in San Francisco and testify uh, that we were too rough for the Steelers. It was such a joke. Give me a break. And when I just go in there and I, I show him this ring and I show him the score on the side of this ring, Al Davis put 24-7 Raiders, 24 Steelers, 7 on the ring. In Super Bowl XI, the Oakland Raiders completely dominated the Minnesota Vikings. In doing so, the Raiders not only won the 1976 NFL Championship, they put a final definitive end to many years of postseason frustration. We wanted that one Super Bowl, we were committed, we were committed to winning the Super Bowl, not just getting there, but to winning it. And we got there, we won it, and it was the culmination of what you call a dream come true. It shows that if you stick with anything and you believe in it strong enough with conviction and commitment, and you work toward that, that you can accomplish it. And we are the epitome of what hard work is about and what commitment and conviction and what commitment to excellence was about, that 76 team. If you wanted to kind of put it in a, in a capsule, that's the way I would capsulize that team. The 76 Raiders were a collection of outlaws from, uh, from all the major penitentiaries around the country. Some of them were real good athletes, some of them I didn't think were very good athletes. They were just intimidating types, would try and hurt people. From the opening bell to the closing bell, you're going to get hit. You're going to get hit hard, and you're going to get hit consistently. We wanted to leave with them with an impression that, hey, it's not a contact sport, this is a collision sport, and that's what we did. We made collisions with where I received it. If he did make a catch, he paid a big price for it. He was going to get hit, you know, he was going to get abused verbally, physically. Any other thing we could do to take his mind off of what he had to do and just intimidate him a little bit. And you thought of the Raiders and the mystique of the Raiders you knew going into the ball game that you were going to get hit. Now, the key was whether you was going to get hit fairly or whether it's going to be a cheap shot. It was just kind of a feeling that once you became a Raider, 
You were going to go out and you were going to destroy people. You were going to hit them. You were going to intimidate them. And uh, like we used to say in practice, first one cries a sissy. <laughs> the many crybabies left in the wake of the Silver and Blacks bullying included the New England Patriots, who lost to the Raiders in the 1976 playoffs. But this game eventually resulted in one Patriot exacting a measure of revenge for a controversial play. It was a, a play where Phil Villapiano, outside linebacker, is covering me. I have to battle him offline. He's hanging on my, on my face mask, punching me in the throat. Typical Raider. Uh, defense and I make the break to the sideline he's right there and grabs my hands and my arms to my side everybody in the country can see this I turn to Ben Dreith who's a line judge and he's looking at Klaus Phil Fu Villapiano I want to kill him just on that play alone I want to kill him so a couple of weeks later he's in Hawaii to do the superstar competition and we go flying to take he and his wife to Maui I had a charter service Halfway between Oahu and Molokai, I tilt the plane up 90 degrees, I open the door and start to push him. And he thinks he's going out the door at uh, 10,000 feet. And his wife was clawing at me and Phil was screaming at the top of his lungs. There was no way he was going to stay on that airplane. We'd do a couple rolls, loops, you know, whatever, and pew, he'd be uh, fish food. Earlier that year, after New England had defeated the Raiders, Francis discovered that the Raiders' mystique flourished even when they weren't flushed with success. I went into their locker room after the game to kind of gloat a little bit, and I knew also they were the only team in the league that allowed cold beer in the locker room, or any beer for that matter. So someone finally directed me around to where Ted Hendricks was, and he's sitting in a stall in the bathroom. There's beer bottles, he's been there for a while, beer bottles sitting around the uh, stall, and uh, he turned around and took a $100 bill out of his wallet and threw it in the toilet. And I said, what are you doing throwing a $100 bill in the toilet? He said, well, uh, when I was standing up, brought my pants up, a $5 bill fell out of my front pocket into the toilet. I wasn't going in there for five bucks. That was the Raider mentality. That was what you were dealing with. That's what you're playing against. Those guys are weird. The weirdness was no mask, and the team's bad boy image was shaped during a summer camp that seemed more like a funny farm, thanks to unofficial activities director Phil Villapiano, number 41. I thought the boys would like to have a little entertainment, so I found this lovely young lady down the, the bar the night before, and I paid her to show up at practice, and she streaked the practice field. And, <laughs> and <laughs> Madden blows the whistle, time out, go ahead, do what you gotta do, now get out of here, you know. Villa Piano, with his antics, every year he would form these different events for us. To keep camp from being so monotonous, he would break the monotony with these different games, and they were all about who could cheat the best. I remember in one hockey tournament that year, they uh, put a, uh, this is uh, air hockey, okay? The, um, they put a, a plastic uh, glass across one of the goals. So, uh, None of the pucks from the opposing team could go in, and it, w and it was unnoticed till the final game that uh, why the team had got there to the, to the playoffs. <laughs> we had one rule with the Rays when we were playing golf, and that was if you wasn't cheating, you wasn't trying. It was a fun team to be around. We were about a family, teamwork, and we, we believed in that old saying, once a Raider, always a Raider. And we were, we were Raider players that uh, believed in one another, and we showed it on the field as well as off the field. The 1976 Raiders mystique was part fun, part ferocity, and this split personality helped them attain the singular identity of a champion. <laughs>